Yay! Hello, everyone. Happy Fierce Female Friday. We have another fabulous show for you today. As always, let us know that you're here. Of course, if you can't hear us, let us know that because we are watching the stream, but we're pretty confident you can hear us today. Uh, and let us know where you are watching from. Are you home? Are you on vacay somewhere? Are you taking a staycation? So you're out by the pool with your winter jacket on. Like what is the scene where you are? We'd love to get some smiles and giggles going in the comments. Uh, we have um, a few updates. Next week is crazy. Uh, this month we have of course been honoring all sorts of fabulous, fierce Black women for Black History Month. But as we've said before, every month is Black History Month and Black History is everyone's history. So yeah. we are continuing that theme into Women's History Month <laughs> next month. Uh, women's history is everyone's history too. So we have some amazing uh, things up next month as well, starting on March 1st, which is Monday. We are going to be asking all of you to go through your phone, scroll through your photos, and we are going to ask you to share one or two or 10 photos of you with a woman who has rocked your world, a woman who has inspired, supported, empowered, encouraged, kicked you in the tush along your path to help you reach your potential. So we're going to want a picture of the two of you and of course a little bit about your story so we're going to be starting that on monday on the facebook group so start pulling your photos together because we are so excited about this project uh and make sure that it's a photo you both love you know what i'm talking about like there's triple chins on her do not put that in the stream because we want to share these images in our promotions not only in march but throughout the year so Please, please, please pull those together. Uh, March 3rd, doo, 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 we have our inaugural Coffee and Conversations with Leslie. Uh, she's actually going to do the first show live so that she can do some Q&A with us afterwards and get a feel for what everyone is interested in hearing for, uh, from her. So make sure that you have Wednesday the 3rd on your calendar, 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. her time. Pour your coffee, snuggle on in with us. We are gonna, uh, what she has on, on plans for Wednesday is so good. You don't wanna miss it. And then we are closing out the first week of March with Sherry Chris. She is joining us for a conversation about the new findings in the Realogy Expansion Brands white paper on COVID or real estate in the time of COVID. And holy smokes, that, that research paper is packed with so much great information, amazing insights that are gonna help all of us. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, next week, goodness coming to you. <sighs> Leslie, besides your debut next Wednesday, what is on your mind? Just a, a couple of things, you know, we're starting 2021 with a very, very strong market. And I would say there's three to four to 18 articles every week about the um, limited inventory, how quickly properties that come onto the market sell, about the um, multiple offers. It's just very, very difficult. And we've got double digit price appreciation, regardless of what index you're looking at and what methodology they use. We know the market is red hot. So this is going to be a very challenging market again for uh, realtors. It's a great market and lots of realtors are doing incredibly well, but how do you get listings? How do you find, how do you answer the question? I'd love to sell, but where am I going to go? What is that going to look like? So I was reminded, I was catching up on my reading and in the February 15th slash 22nd issue of The New Yorker, there's a profile on Glendon Doyle. And if you recall a few months ago uh, in the Women Up Book Club, uh, we read her book Untamed. But if you recall, one of her catchphrases is, we can do hard things. <laughs> And she uses it over and over. And it just kind of reminded me of 
where we are with the market and we can do hard things. We've got to be creative in how we, we do that. Uh, the other thing that's on my mind was a little bit of kind of good news, bad news in the New York Times business section. Uh, it actually made it on the front page below the fold, but it the headline was doubts feed economics gender gap. And as many of you know, I've addressed this in my Women Up um, uh, topics a, a number of times and, and on the uh, mage stage. And they talked about two of the um, two economists were at the back of the room in a professional conference. And one of the rising stars in economics is up to present her findings. And the topic is inequality. And you, you do find that women tend to study different things, right? They tend to study um, more labor economics. They tend to study more um, inequality, wage gap, all those kinds of um, those kinds of issues. And what they said is, um, a rising star in their field present her latest research on inequality, or at least she was meant to present it. Moments after she began her talk, the audience began peppering her with questions. She must have gotten fifteen questions in the first five minutes, including, "Are you going to show us the data?" Which is odd given that it was applied microeconomics and it's all about data. And of course she was. So these two economists essentially got this whole crowd of uh, graduate students to go out to professional conferences, seminars, and collect data on the presenters and how many questions they were asked. And what they found was a st significant, statistically significantly more questions are asked of the female presenters than the male presenters. And I present this as, um, you know, here's the um, uh, women account for fewer than a quarter of the economics talks given, racial minorities are also in even more underrepresented, barely 1% of the speakers were black or Hispanic. So it's, additional evidence of the fact that gender, gender discrimination in economics exists and these gaps are wider than in many other professions and they're closing much slower over time. So I am your, not that everyone's interested in this, but I am your beacon into the economics profession. <laughs> and I will continue to report back and hopefully be able to document um, some improvement. The one good thing is, there's a language about this now, right? There are conversations. It's not, it's not hidden, right? It is, it says uh, for women in economics, the hostility they face is out in the open. And I know I've mentioned the Sadie Collective to you um, a number of times about the black economists, PhD women who have this fabulous um, organization uh, going. And that's really what they're, trying to do, you know, is to is to shine a light on this. So I, I support them. And thank you for letting me give you this update. Oh, that was so good. I love, love, love that you still sprinkle in information on the economy and what's happening in uh, from your uh, economist hat. We love it. So please don't ever stop oh, until, I'll always you, have a few until you want to. to. You know me. <laughs> and, I, and I love that story. We'll share the, the link to the article in the chat, but it did remind me of, you know, the same reason we started Woman Up, right? Was we saw this disparity and these two women started throwing their heads into, you know, their mind is data, right? And they looked at the data and Janet Dorsey was asking, you know, what was the conclusion um, to women being asked more questions? And I think the conclusion is that they started this conversation about um, the disparity and the, and the differential treatment between men economists and women economists, right? And it's, you know, the bottom line is if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. You know, these seminars are supposed to um, be a, a platform where you are grilled, you know, that's, that's the way it is. So that's why it's kind of this, this gray area. And, you know, a lot of economists, male and female go through difficult periods, difficult experiences and seminars, but when all is said and done, because the women aren't welcome, <laughs> they get it more right. They mm -hmm. aren't even given a chance to lay out their hypothesis and findings before they get these well, questions. And I think, I think that's maybe that's where the distinguishing needs to happen. It's not that they were being asked questions is that they were being questioned. 
Or I think we're being asked the questions that the men weren't being asked either. Yes. Right? Yeah. And that's what I mean. It's like question when you get questions and you're at a seminar, or when you're a speaker or a trainer and somebody's asking you questions to clarify what you've shared, that's different than being grilled about is what you're saying really true. Well, and not even being able to share much, you know, right. just getting yeah. hijacked immediately getting your seminar hijacked in the first five minutes is right. interesting. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Anyway, well, I'm so excited to be here to hear what Marky has to say. Well, no, what's so perfect about this segue right into talking about Marky is that <laughs> Marky knows how to own the mic. <laughs> and uh-huh. for anybody who has ever been blessed to see her speak, to be in her presence live or virtually, you know what I'm talking about. So let me read to you a little bit about this remarkable, remarkable, (laughs) we're going to talk about that, Uh, six-time Realtor Conference Expo featured attendee, one of 100 speakers selected out over over 500 speakers to speak at the Realtor Conference and Expo, not once, not twice, seven times. Come on now. Face-to-face and virtually, she has been in our space, speaking into and over us. Such greatness. Uh, Her programs are always highly rated. So if you have been in the room, you know what I'm talking about. Again, she's also been an Inman closing keynote speaker. Uh, She's a licensed managing broker, realtor, avid volunteer, major donor, and international bestseller of the Modern Real Estate Professional's Guide to Success. Mm -hmm. In 2019, Marky was nominated as a RIS Media's Real Estate Newsmaker and inducted into the ARB... the Reback, sorry, it didn't look right on my side. The Reback Hall of Fame, I'm like, what does that say? Mm-mm. And we actually are going to talk about being nominated and being on lists today because I saw Marky give a fiery challenge uh, about the Stefan Swanepoel list um, a few weeks ago. So we're going to dig into that. Um, Marky is dedicated to all things real estate. With 30 years of marketing experience, she's taught over 500,000 people face-to-face and virtually how to earn up to return on their marketing dollars. (laughs) She holds a Bachelor of Science in Management from Chicago State University, a Master's in Business Administration from St. Xavier University, and 60 real estate-related licenses, certifications, and designations. Woo! (laughs) <laughs> welcome, welcome, Marky. Oh my goodness, how Thank are you? Thank you. I am doing wonderful. And when you were talking about the weather, I had to look out the window because here in the city of Chicago, we have literally been snowed in for a few weeks. And today <laughs> the snow is starting to melt. So it is sunshine and warmer weather. Hey. Marky, I'm from Southern California. I will not show you my window. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Marky, that is an incredible, incredible bio. And I would, and I know there are a lot of our our community listening in today, and we just want to know what your journey was to being invited and renowned speaker for NAR and Inman and being invited so many times. And what, you know, what was that journey like? Tell us a little bit about that. So my journey is quite interesting. I was born and raised here on the south side of Chicago. I have always lived in Chicago with the exception of going away to an historic black college my freshman year and being a foreign exchange student living in Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, My family is quite unique here in the city of Chicago. We own Chicago's second oldest black restaurant. We have sold more pork rib tips than anyone else in the city of Chicago. So I was supposed to be in the restaurant business, um, not even in the world of real estate, but I was born and raised an entrepreneur. So I have always basically went and got my own money by whatever means that was. And it actually started at the tender age of 10. I had to sell snowballs 
in front or ice cones, some people might call them, in front of our barbecue restaurant because I asked for one too many pair of designer blue jeans. And so I came into the world of real estate in 1999. Once uh, I was actually in the midst of a bitter lawsuit with my family because I owned the trademark right for our business name. And my father's sister sued me and I had to counter sue my family and they had to buy me out. And when I came into real estate, the reason I chose it as an occupation, I was an unwedded mother and I wanted to earn an above average income yet feel like a stay at home mom. I am a uh, I am a workaholic. I love work. So it didn't mean that I did not want to work, but I did want the flexibility of my time because I'm the mother who likes to pop up at school. I want to know who my children's friends are. So I really know who they are. And I like to volunteer. Mm -hmm. So I came in as a loan originator. And uh, I got burned out and I went and got a real job. You know, people in real estate say that I'm gonna go get me a real job as if this is not the realest of real jobs one could ever have. And I decided to moonlight, get this as a pharmaceutical sales rep at Pfizer Pharmaceuticals because I wanted a company car and expense allowance and a good job. And I hated it. So as I was planning to quit my good pharmaceutical sales job to come back into real estate, I was looking at the numbers and as a loan originator to earn the amount of money I wanted to earn, I would have had to originate 141 loans. And at the time I visually could not see what that would look like and still be Skylar's mom. So I decided that I would use this broker's license that I had got, you know, it was just collecting dust and I would open a real estate company. And I came back into real estate on July the 31st, 2003. And in December, I had over $24,000 in gross close commission. I figured it would take me 10 years to earn that amount of money in a month in farm sales and that I would be staying right here in this industry. And I always say that Frank Williams single-handedly, uh, he single-handedly changed and orchestrated my real estate career. Uh, Frank Williams is the second black president of the Chicago Association of Realtors. He's been in real estate as long as I am old. And I had come out to be on the board of directors of the Chicago Association of Realtors three times. Now I was, I was hot as a firecracker the second time they did not put me on the board. And I took Frank out because I wanted to know what was really going on. I'm like, look, I'm in the top 10% of real. You took group. him out to eat. I took him out to eat. Yes, I had, I had to eat. <laughs> I, you know, did I, no, no, we went to a, a soul food restaurant on the South side. So he Frank know all the good spots. He'll tell you exactly where he want to go break bread at. And so I took him out and he told me, uh, Cause he's a straight shooter. He said, "Look at here, baby doll," and that he, I'm still baby doll. He said, "Look at here now, baby doll." He says, "You know, people need to be able to put a face with the name, and they don't know who you are. So I'm going to need you to volunteer more, so they know who you are. So when I'm sitting in there on nominating committee, I can speak on your behalf." Mm. And th so for the next year, I got my volunteering up, and. I knew I was going on the board of directors that third time when uh, Kamisic, who's a past state president, walked me, escorted me to the door and said, Marky, I see your growth. When I walked out, I knew that was going to be my year. Mm. And so, but here's what's funny. There's a young gentleman who beat me out for the board in 2005 and I was mad at him. I've been mad at Dennis White all these years because I didn't know how they was going to select no Dennis White over Marky Lemons. <laughs> well, let me tell you about Dennis White because I got to give him kudos. He is past head legal counsel for Chicago Park District and the mayor just appointed him to a $3 billion fund. So it wasn't until he got appointed to the $3 billion fund that I thought that he was better than me and should have went on the board before me. So that's the way, that's the way my ego set up, right? Like, Show me the money, right? <laughs> yeah, he got it, it. It got me all the way together that Marky, Dennis was the better candidate at the time. <laughs> D d divine appointment, right? Divine, divine appointment. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> that is so great. I love that. Well, and and so Frank helped me out. He, he gave me guidance and direction. And even probably even before Frank, there is Ezekiel Zeke Morris, who's a past liaison to the president of NAR. 
he had uh, been trying to recruit me and tell me what to do uh, since I came into real estate and I kind of ignored him. And then finally, when he got a hold of me, he has not let go. And that's probably been for the past 15 years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I love it so yeah. much. Well, and, and you know, what I, what I'm hearing is, uh, one of the common themes inside the woman up community Marky, is uh, shining a light on the mentors who uh, helped us along the way right we we never arrive where we are alone and it's so important for us to all do that so for everyone listening take some time over this weekend to go through your phone and find those mentors and put your photos on the internet in here in the <laughs> facebook group <laughs> Because we want to honor them. I love these stories. This is what inspires us to also become mentors, right, Marky? It is. Um, to whom much is given, much is expected. And I was, Frank made it very clear that he had no problems pouring into me, but that there's a level of expectation. Mm -hmm. And he anticipated that I would help someone in the future. Um, and here's what's funny about Frank. At our barbecue restaurant, when I came into real estate, I wanted my magnet to go next to the cash register. Well, Frank's magnet has been next to the cash register as long as I've been old. My granddaddy told me my magnet could not go next to the cash <laughs> register because Frank's magnet was next to the cash register. So I'd, I'd, I'd seen his magnet, but did not know who who he was. Mm -hmm. And so he tells me all the time that I make him proud, but I want him to be proud because he changed my life. And it's not just him. Zeke changed my life and I could just, and Terry Watson changed my life. And so, so many people have given me time, energy, and resources to be better. But as I've had to explain to some of, to some women, closed mouths don't get fed. And so if you don't speak up and ask questions on your behalf, they're not mind readers. I am clear, I am vocal about what I want to do. Marky, that's a, this is a really great point. Closed mouths do not get fed. And I, I want to know, like, along that journey, where you, where you learned that, was it, and it, and where was that flip of the switch or was it always like that? I mean, maybe it was, maybe you were born that way, but um, I, I just want to know like how, how you grew along the way. So my mother was a teen unwedded mother and I was a unwedded mother, but I wasn't a teenager. And my mother always wanted to be a good mother. Like it was something she just wanted the best for me, but she also acknowledged the fact that she didn't know. So my mother was consistently reaching out to people to ask for resources to ensure that I had the absolute best. What she did know was that if she found it, my granddaddy would pay for it. OK, and so she she had already secured. I just, that was my number one advocate. She had secured her financial sponsor. Now, let me go find all these resources. Right. And my mother was fearless. My mother quit her job as a dietitian to go sell hot dogs in the park. My mother had a food truck in 1982 in Chicago. And when you're in a private school, your friends often joke about your mama selling hot dogs in the park. And I'm saying it the same way they would say it, right? Uh, yeah, how many hot dogs did your mama have to sell in the park, Marky? And it was, it was consistent. And when I was 16, that's when I lived in Reykjavik, Iceland, and I came home and I had a, this is 1986, I had a 1977 sky blue Camaro. And when I get to Ooh. school, one of my classmates from grammar school and high school says, so how many lemons, so how many hot dogs did your mama have to sell in the park this summer to send you to Iceland? I said, well, clearly my mama making more money selling hot dogs in the park than your mama made because you ain't been nowhere. And would you like a ride home since you ain't got a car either? That was the a defining <laughs> wow. moment for me because I realized right at that moment that yes, my mother did sell hot dogs in the park, but based on lifestyle, the fact that she, look, she figured out this private school situation. I'm traveling, I'm traveling in style. I come home, I got a car. What is it that you think your mama does better <laughs> than my mother when I'm living this great life? And it also let me realize that perception is not always reality. Mm. So a lot of things mm. you will hear me say, it is my mother speaking. So a lot of lessons uh, that I have, my hero is my 
mother. Mm -hmm. She showed me. You know, she didn't tell me. She showed me. I was if she was going through it because she was 17 years older than me. I was going through it, too. Look, she was grabbing me by the hand. Hey, this is what we doing today. <laughs> and we was doing it together. So I was I was uh, eavesdropping on grown folks conversation at a very early age. <laughs> you know, Marky, last um, our last uh, week's episode, I talked about this book I was excited to receive. And it's a woman named Norma Kamali, who's a, a designer. And she met the love of her life at 65. And she's now 75. And her whole mantra or her whole being has to do with aging with power. And what you just said about your mother reminded me of her dedication in the beginning of her book, because her mother was just she wasn't like anybody else's mother. I mean, she had a, a juicer that was as big as a car engine, you know, and all this crazy food they were eating and making all her clothes and stuff. And so her dedication, I don't have the book with me right now, but her dedication is so beautiful. And at the end, she said, I have become her. And that just what you just said about your mother, you have become her. And it's just, I mean, that's a whole nother women up discussion about our mothers, but it's, um, just a beautiful for you to share that. So I'd like to talk a little bit about advice that you have for other women looking at you now, right? And you've talked a little bit about paying it forward. You know, the, the people that helped you were like, hey, what you need to do is help others. So where do you start, especially for people that may not have, you're very confident, you're very out there, you're, you're eating the world. Um, you know, not everyone's kind of wired that way. And, and just talk a little bit about your mentees and what that looks like and advice that you might might be able to share. So I guess I'm gonna have to go back to my mother again. And what's funny, when I went to Iceland, my mother purchased me a powder blue knit Norma Kamali two piece outfit that I took <laughs> to Reykjavik, yeah. Iceland with me. So I, I, that what? is a Huge coincidence. Yes. I am obsessed with Norma. I am she's yes. like my spirit animal. And of <laughs> course, here you are, right? Oh my God. <laughs> wow. So I'm going to tell you another lesson um, that my mother, uh, I got from my mother. Now, there are some things that I did not take advice from her. And I didn't take advice from her about men because I never, my father and I have a very strange relationship. And I told her, I said, you can't give me any advice about a man because that is who you decided you should marry. Then she looked at me and she said, you, you know what? You're absolutely right. You have a valid point. But let me give you a piece of advice that I would give to uh, my mentees based on my mother. <clears throat> and it was the fact that when I, I got married late, uh, I was 36 and she looked at me and she says, you know, Marky, Stephen, I think that might be the man you're going to marry. Can you make me a promise? And I'm like, a promise? Okay, what's the promise? She says, <laughs> when women get married, they tend to lose themselves in their husband and forget about their dreams, their goals, their desires. She says, if this is the man that you're going to be with, I want you to promise me that you're going to continue to do what you set out to do. She said, but now, I don't want you to try to force him to be any different than what he is. She said, either Stephen will get tired of holding on to you and he'll let go, or Stephen will get tired of holding on to you and he'll catch up, but allow that to be his choice. And so mm -hmm. when I'm out here doing things that traditionally you don't see a lot of women do, especially women of color, I'm thinking that this is what I always wanted to do. And Stephen will tell you he is holding on for dear life. So I will pull, because I got a good husband. So Stephen can come <laughs> along with me, but Stephen cannot stop me. And and even in the kitchen, like sometimes you know how somebody want to get your attention, they are standing your way. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely hate that. Do not try to block me or stop me while I am in the midst of movement, no matter what that looks like. Because... To me, it's like a roadblock and I don't like roadblocks because then I go into a whole different mindset because I'm going to run you over. OK, <laughs> so at the end of the day, I need you to politely just say this is not for you right now. Go on and step to the side, but don't hinder anyone else from their progress. Yeah. And I'm always told in my house that I'm a workaholic and my way to counter that. I love work. This is how I was born. This is how I was raised. 
I don't come and tell you I think you being lazy, lazy and not doing enough. Therefore, it's not okay for you to shame me for working too much when I don't think you working enough. And so we have, we have come to a nice little meeting spot. I like to work. Y'all like to chill. I don't come and mess with your chill. Don't come and mess with my work. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. <laughs> I love that, Marky. You know, and it goes back to one of, on, on Wednesday, I'm going to talk about some life lessons. And one of them that um, you just reminded me of is, you know, the most important career decision you make is who you marry, you know, who you choose as your partner. And you are, you just gave a beautiful example of that. Yes, it, it's, um, you know what, I, I joked with my husband last week because it hit me. I realized I'm his muse, right? And my husband, he says, well, where do you find this stuff? Like, I've never heard anyone in this generation to say that. I said, I am your creative inspiration. Yes. yes. I am clear about right. that. You, when, he's so happy when he cooks a great meal. And, and look, he'll even wipe the plate off first of all, when we got married, he would burn the whole meal up and didn't care anything about it. It was all meat. He didn't believe in side dishes, right? Now you got side dishes and presentation going on. Get out of here. I'm your creative inspiration. And he comes upstairs and he just smiles. And it, all he's waiting for is me to say, oh, this is good. This is delicious. Ooh, you sure enough showing out in that kitchen today. And then if I call him daddy, baby, he is just over the moon. Hey, daddy. <laughs> you know, I think our husbands are, are uh, brothers from another mother because that's totally interesting. <laughs> My husband's a drummer. Does yours play any instruments? No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> So I found the, um, the quote that you read Le Leslie last week. Do you, shall I read it? Sure. Okay. Are you ready? Everyone open your hearts and your minds and be ready to receive this message from Norma Kamali. I am invincible when I feel empowered. And when I am healthy, I am strong. And then I can do all the things I need to do to reach the goals I need to reach in order to fulfill my big dreams that are as big as the world and as optimistic as my mind can imagine, I will age with power and influence and change because I know my purpose. Mm. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Come that on. That is so good. You That's know, good. one of my prayers uh, consistently is that I am granted physical and mental clarity because when I worked at Pfizer, I sold Zoloft and Aricept. And I realized that it's really, it's a chemical imbalance, but it only takes one little thing to trigger that. And if you lose your mind, you can't even tell the physical essentially what to do, right? And so I consistently just ask for mental clarity and physical endurance. Because if you have those two things, you can do anything. Mm. Absolutely. It's so true. So true. Oh my those are non-negotiable. At the top. I feel like my cup is overflowing and we've only gotten into like one or two of our questions. Um, <laughs> 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 so I, I would actually love to jump into talking about what you love to teach, right? There's so many of us who are here today who have taken a class with you, who have heard you give a keynote in the past. And so when, when people come knocking on your door and say, hey, Marky, I want you to be my mentor. What are those topics that you say, well, here are the things I want to spread the wisdom around. Uh, what are those topics? What do you love to talk about? Well, I kind of want to go back to them coming and knock on the door for me to be their mentor. <clears throat> sure. Okay. When I look at uh, my sphere of influence, my inner circle, we are all volunteers. We are all major donors. We all like to educate and provide information freely. So when I am going to mentor someone, if they don't come from contribution, if they're not volunteering, giving to others, I think it's unfair that they would ask for anyone to pour into them. Mm. And so I want to know what are you giving to others in order to be able to receive from someone else. And, and that's the grind. And a lot of people, it's all about them. 
right? They want to pick everybody's brain, but they haven't done anything for anyone. I would not be your mentor. I can just tell you, I need you to go violent. I need, look, I need you to do what Frank told me to do. I'm going to need you to volunteer more to be able to even volunteer. And so that would be first and foremost uh, when they come and they ask me, I love social media and <laughs> technology, period. Uh, and let me say this, because I'm 50 years old, I was not born and raised with social media and technology. I had to force myself to use it. Uh, I'm not a, a, I don't even think I'm necessarily an early adapter, because I think then I would have started using it in the 90s. I started using it when the 2006 profile of buyers and sellers came out. And when I Googled my name, it came up less than 10 times. And I realized I wasn't hanging out online where the buyers and the sellers were hanging out. But when I think about what I do because of books I've read and just taking a look and analyzing my life, if I was to go back to 2012, my money was funny, my energy was zapped, and I did not have enough time to date my husband. Therefore, I decided that I needed to niche more. The more you niche, the more money you make. And oftentimes as women, because we can do so many things well, we think we should do them all. Mm -hmm. And I have told people time and time again, if I look at those best years of my life, and when I say best, I don't just mean financially. I mean, like I had fun. It was a great year with little stress. Uh, I had family outings and a lot of activities. The times that I had, I earned the most amount of money with the highest level of happiness. I was always very niched. I was focused on one thing. So when I was in the barbecue business and I only sold barbecue before we had, you know, concessions and all this other stuff, I loved it. When I only sold real estate before I started flipping houses and teaching classes, right? And so now when I look at my life, it's all about education. And then I have three main buckets in which I make money from with some other you know, low hanging fruit. And as I tell people, I actually took an income stream off because it was not a good utilization of the time. Mm -hmm. And so one, you have to be of service to others and then focus on a niche, know what the numbers say. In undergrad and grad school, I definitely liked economics and I think I liked a little bit of finance, but I hate it statistics. I just thought at 24, I did not want to know the probability of something occurring between zero and one. But once <laughs> you come into real estate, you want to know the probability. If I make this phone call, if I send this direct mail piece, if I put a follow-up system in place. So now I want them to understand the numbers because 20% yeah. of our biz, you know, 20% of our agents get 80% of the business. And I've seen people come in with a strategic business plan. They hit the, the ground running and they are a top producer within a year. That was something that I know worked for me. I had a business plan. And so a business plan, a marketing plan, a social media plan, but you need to be niched and you need to understand the avatar or the persona of the people in which you plan to serve. So true. Marky, what is your niche? Oh, my what niche. are your niches? Oh, so, uh, so first of all, I only work with realtors. So 1.4 million people. I let everyone know that I have an intimate relationship with real estate professionals and my community. And I teach them how to leverage video for lead generation. So if I was going to even get all the way niched, it would be video sales funnels. Got it. Did you go through like a process or it may, maybe it's your, uh, what you learned in your MBA program, but like when, where in the line did you say, I need to reassess and niche? I've, I think I've always said it, but let me take you back. When I was in undergrad, I owned a restaurant and the restaurant failed. It was called Looney's Hamburgers. And I'm a junior in college and I'm like, oh, I'm going to grad school because clearly I don't know enough. 
So I go to grad school. Then I want to launch our barbecue sauce, our meat rub. And at the time, Arthur and Cousin, who was part of uh, past President Obama's cabinet, she was a VP at Jules. And I realized that the MBA program taught me how to go in and take over existing businesses, but it didn't teach me anything about startups. So I went through the Women Self-Employment Project in order to be able to launch our barbecue sauce, meat rubs, and hot links. So for me, I have no problems admitting, girl, you know you don't know nothing. You better go and reassess this. For the niching part, it was because I read the book, The One Thing, and I, I understood the feeling. Love that book. Right? It, the book is phenomenal, but I understood the feeling. I knew my money was funny. The bank accounts told me that. I was not happy. I was not dating my husband. And so it was It was my house and I'm working. And I mean, I'm working all hours of the night and I can't get anything leveled. And then I did one of those pie charts, right? And my professional development, oh, that's phenomenal. My love life, oh, that's horrible. And I'm like, oh, Marky what you gonna do about this? So I just sat down and I started thinking, so when did you make the most amount of money and have the highest level of happiness? Mm -hmm. And every time I was coming up with a reoccurring thing, girl, when you weren't trying to be all things to all people, now that presents his own set of problems. Cause saying no, they make that sound like that's a dirty word. Like you just cussed them out. Uh -uh. No is no. That's right. No, no. Nope. No, it's a complete sentence. No. Yes. And it doesn't, it, at the end. it doesn't require explanation either. You know, no. I think that that's so many people sentence. say no. And then they like try and, uh, you, you know, they, they stumble over their why for giving the no. And the reality is no one needs to know that. A no is. Nobody, you don't have to do that. No. Uh, you know what? I published a book for my cousin. This is the first time I'm going to publicly say it because he agitated my poor little soul. And so I ignored his email, right? So then he sends me a text message. In the text message, he says to me, he says to me, he says, well, can you just uh, basically let me know if that's a yes or a no, right? So I send a message back. I said, I will not be able to help. That was it. I will not be able to help period, right? Because I've been through landmark form. I, I had a psychiatrist, a therapist, everything. So I know how to get out myself out of the situation. How about <laughs> the message back was I was hostile and had turned my back on him. <clears throat> I said, oh, shame, shame. Oh, I said, oh, so now we, we know, just know. And as I told him, I said, you know what? I had the right to ignore you. <laughs> understand that I had but I had to get clear because he says that you're lumping me with everyone else I said no I'm not lumping you with everyone else I am putting me first so so powerful and that it wasn't just him I tell my husband no I tell my children no I'm putting me first let's go back to the fact that I sold Zoloft and Aricept <laughs> right uh, right. that, that could happen to anyone, right? When you stressed out, you, you're, you're overwhelmed. Overwhelmed to me is the worst feeling ever. Yeah. It's the feeling that I like to avoid and I can't avoid it if I'm scheduled properly. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Well, this is, this is a common theme inside this community, as you can imagine, right? The, uh, we've read so many books and articles and white papers about how uh, women wait to be asked, but when they're asked, they say yes, even if they should say no, because they are, they want to please people. They don't want to disappoint anyone. And we've had some really deep conversations on, on this topic, Marky. And I think one of the things that has helped and for anyone who is listening here live or watching the replay, you know, having a sentence together that you can say on repeat, having a personal protection script that says, I'm so honored you asked. My volunteer time this month is booked, but I have somebody in mind that might be able to help you. Let me check with them and I'll get back to you. Like 
have something that makes you feel comfortable that you can say back. If you don't like to say no, if you don't want to say no, if you need something else, but know your response, know your response that will help you protect that boundary. Cause I love when you look right in the camera Marky, and you're saying, I put myself first, no apologies, period. So good. I remember in the How Women Rise book that someone had a friend that would call and ask her to do things to practice saying no, you know, just kind of get your <laughs> elevator speech going. You know? yeah. yeah, it's like having that tool in your toolbox, right? right. If you have it canned, ready to go, no problems whatsoever. But, you know, in order to have that be important to you, you have to have a vision of what you want to do, right? And yeah. and and that's, I think, the other part of it. And you talked about purpose a little bit, you know, like you wanted to do all this. And so that was going to take you off task, right? And you, but, but so it's important to define what you need for you, right? And I, I love how you're always looking at money and happiness together, right? That those are two aspects of your life <laughs> that, that, that bring the whole, you know? What, what some people know, so even though I was, I would, most people say, well, Marky was born with a silver spoon in her mouth, right? Because there was, there was plenty of money and my grandparents were established, all of them at the time in which I was born, but my parents were teen parents, but my parents were both the black sheeps of their family. And both of my parents, my father right now is still addicted to some drug. I just don't know what that drug is, but my mother even in the midst of everything that she did, when I went away to college, she started using drugs and I had to deal with a 15 year addiction. All the money in the world did not solve, the best drug rehabs in the country did not solve that problem. And so I am clear that money does not equal happiness, period. And my grandparents would have threw all the money, right? in order to resolve their situation for them. And it didn't mean nothing. Yeah. yeah. And so one, I don't ever, I knew at the age of six, what I wasn't going to do and I'm not going to get high. Okay. I, I'm this way sober. This is me all the time. People want to know well, how much coffee you drink. I drink that one little thing of Yeti per day. I'm the least likely person who going to drink at the party. And nope, I'm not trying none of the experimental drugs because I didn't have my fair share, okay, with my parents. But I knew. And here's the thing, right? And my grandparents had the money and financially could help them. But it broke their hearts. Yeah, it's not about mm -hmm. that. Right? It wasn't about that. So I am clear that the money does not bring about the happiness and that you can't pay for it. You know, how, how many, how many red bottom pair of shoes does one person need in order to get happy? <laughs> they're not happy. They're going to buy another pair, right? I'm even looking now in the midst of the pandemic, how many people who profess they were already living their best life, but can't sit still for one hot second. Like you can't just chill with yourself for a minute. Just take a deep breath and enjoy you. And I have friends. Can we come over? Oh, no, honey. Me and Steve, and we entertain each other all day. We don't need no company. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, my husband, we've been invited places to be the entertainment. And I tell them all the time, we're not the entertainment. And we don't need an audience to act the way we act. <laughs> right. Is there anything that we haven't covered? I know Deborah's about to say we're running out of time and we <laughs> really want to make sure that if there was anything that you just wanted, wanted to get out that we left time for, um, for that. Oh, yes. The Marky Lemons Rao Education Advancement Scholarship. Ha! So let, how much time I got? Because, you know, I can talk my butt off, Deborah. Tell, tell me. Okay. As much time as you want. So I, I was forced to come home Friday, March the 13th. I would have been on the road 100 nights in 2020. I ended up delivering 125 webinars. When I came home, I instantly just went into quarantine. My husband and I are both COVID survivors. I caught it about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago. He got it or was confirmed to have it on March the 28th. So I'm like, okay, I just need to stay at home and chill out. When the riots erupted in the city of Chicago, I, I, I knew on the news what was going on around me, but I had not experienced it firsthand. 
when I decide to come out to help my fellow realtors in their volunteer efforts, it just breaks me to the core of my being. Now, mind you, they didn't touch either of our real estate offices. They did not touch the barbecue businesses. None of that was touched, okay? But it's what the destruction I saw to the community. So I did a Facebook Live video that raised over $50,000 for the 77, which is the Diversity Committee of the Chicago Association of Realtors. Now, my goal was only to raise 5000 but it raised over 50000 So when you have that kind of nest egg, you can leverage that for matching donations. The 77 is now giving scholarships back to businesses in the city of Chicago because they received a $50,000 match, a $25,000 match, $2,500 from here. Well, once I raised the money, you know, I, I got a little cocky. I said, oh, I didn't know a girl could raise no money. Let me go see what else I can do. <laughs> so I wrote a eight notebook collection, the Be Remarkable Journals, that's over on Kindle or better yet, yet KDP, Kindle Print on Demand under Amazon. I came up with the Marky Lemons Rao Education Advancement Scholarship to help African-American females in underserved communities of the city of Chicago to either attend an HBCU or to get their real estate license. I then came back and did some more Facebook Live videos. And in our first year, we will help 10 females. So that is that is uh, near and dear to my heart. And the journal sales on Amazon helped to fund the scholarship because historically, I didn't like to ask for money. Uh, I am asking for money to help <laughs> send these young ladies to college, uh, but the notebook collection offsets uh, the funding efforts for the Marky Lemons Rao Education Advancement Scholarship. I love that. I dropped a couple links into the comments, Marky. So feel free um, after to you know send a, a additional links in there. Um, okay, before we wrap up, I do want to give you the an open mic to speak into the ladies like you did about the the list and who you saw on the list and who wasn't on the list so um this this must have been i don't know maybe a month ago uh this is the uh the list list. Mm -hmm. lord have mercy we don't speak of but i yeah we don't really say the name of the list everyone knows what we're talking about the the list 200 (laughs) i got you the list Um, and and specifically yeah i I think i actually shared that video here on the group back when you when you shared the message but just to set this up a little bit um there this industry loves lists they love to put out lists and most of the lists are like marketing lists. They're trying to get people to work with them. That's, that's fine. Uh, but you noticed something about this list of 200 and you said something. So there you go. <laughs> so uh, last year, a list came out. And when the list came out, it was of uh, CEOs. Now I happen to know, I think it's 12, 12 black CEOs of what the 700 or however many is it 12 is it 1200 associations and 700 MLSs get my numbers together for me but (laughs) there's only like a dozen black CEOs and I happen to know every last one of them so when I see the list come out because it's on Facebook I slide up on the list publisher and I said well uh, I want to know why don't you have more African Americans on your list because I know 12 dynamic black CEOs that deserve a chance. So he gives me, you know, this rumblings on who they have to select the list, blah, blah, blah. And I still want to know who selects the list, because if you don't have any black people selecting people, then the, the, the list selectors is wrong, right? The list selectors should represent the industry, okay? Yeah. So what I get the information because... I had to now go back to the source. And this is what I tell women and what I also tell black people. You can't get mad if you don't submit an application. Okay. So when these lists come out, once you know there is a list, it is your responsibility to submit to the list. Okay. Because after you submit and you know your credentials are tight, then you get to complain. You don't get to complain if you've never submitted. So I take the list over to the black CEOs. And I said, look at here, did y'all even know this list existed? They were like, no. (laughs) I said, well, next year, everybody needs to do an application 
So next year, when I say something, I know you all submit it. Now, here's what's funny. He did select my CEO, Michelle, but he didn't select, I thought should have been on the list was Matt Defines, right? So now I'm kind of torn on, on the list, right? Um, <laughs> and so when I said closed mouths don't get fed, of course, a lot of my friends are African-American. So they will complain about not being selected, not being acknowledged, not this. I need to know, did you submit an application? Because if you did and you say no, then we need to we need to take a look at it. We need to understand what people don't understand is the strategic plan of the organization. So when I'm submitting, I tend to know the strategic plan so that I can solve the problem. We cannot come, we cannot think about our own personal agendas. You gotta help them meet their goals, right? And so my approach is a lot different because when you tell me no, then I, I, I keep a record because you don't really have a good reason right. mm -hmm. to tell me no, because I'm going to submit and I'm going to meet the strategic plan of the organization, right. okay? Oh, and then I'm going to come back the next year. So it's only so many times I'm going to take a no. So it seems like I get a lot of yeses, but I don't always get a yes. And sometimes I don't submit the second time because it might not meet my strategic goals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the list to me is an unfair list. I think that all lists should represent our industry. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it is time for us to have more women from diverse backgrounds. They don't all have to be African-American, okay? But Asian, Indian, Hispanic, because that is the makeup of the industry. And we definitely need more women because Katie Lance made a tweet a couple of years ago and I always thought it was because I was black. <laughs> Katie like, girl, this sex is industry, please. And I'm like, oh, so you mean it's because I'm black and I'm female? Because I wasn't paying attention, right, <laughs> to, to the sexist part of it. A and here's the thing. Not only is it sexism and racism, it's weightism, it's hairisms. So I don't know which one of these reasons I might not get the job, but I'm going to keep on coming back and I'm going to meet the strategic plan of the organization because yeah. there's only so many yeah. no's I'm going to take before I'm going to slide up on you on Facebook <laughs> and we can have a nice little public discussion <laughs> about the situation that's going on. They're just, you know, not yeah. hostile. Can you help me yeah. understand? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that's that's part of the reason why this community exists, right? Our, our very, to our very core from year one, way back in 2016, when we were writing it on, the, on a whiteboard, it was, we want all voices heard because those voices are the voices of the role models for the people coming behind them. And so that's, I mean, that's part of the pillar of the Woman Up community. And it's Black, it's Asian, it's Indian, it's, you know, Honduran, for that matter, it's everything. And, and that's, you know, you just really hit that for me and that's why we exist. Yeah, yeah. It's, in, it's inclusive and expanding. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that is, you know, when, um, when I listened to, to your message in that video and you were talking about, you know, like you went to all of these people and said, Hey, do you know, the list exists, which is first, right. Awareness, creating awareness. Uh, we do the same with the group. Hey, do you know that this group exists? Do you know women who are in brokerage leadership or ownership who are islands who don't have a community where they can come and belong to or women who question it, right? Because we know mm -hmm. real estate was male designed, but it is not male dominated. And, and that is, that is a very unique thing in the, in leadership that we are in an industry that was male designed, but it is female dominated. And we have that power with our voice, with our feet, with every dollar we spend. And so I love that you joined us today, that you opened your heart and you opened your mouth <laughs> and you fed all of us with this beautiful wisdom. Uh, we actually, I don't know if you know this, Marky, but we actually have Michelle on the show on March 19th. So she'll be here. She'll be talking to us. Uh, she's coming in to, you know, sprinkle some goodness. She was actually here 
part of our uh, inaugural uh, wisdom series in Q4 last year, she came in and joined us on a discussion about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So Excellent. we were connecting the dots, we're tying the red threads together. Uh, we would so love to keep connected. If there is anything that this community can do for you, Marky, please let us know. Like I said, drop all the links you want to in the comments. And we look forward to showering you with love. I know that there's people who are saying they're off to buy every single one of those journals. Thank so you. So ching, ching, <laughs> ching. Let's, let's send some women. Let's help women build their, their divine destinies. I love it. Oh my goodness. Um, any last uh, word of wisdom you want to speak before I close this out? Well, one, I want to thank you for having me. And the word of wisdom is technology will never replace a realtor, but a realtor with technology will replace one without it. Let's embrace technology. Beautiful. Yes, and you know, I have a feeling we will be knocking on your door about some video conversations inside our wisdom series soon. So, mm -hmm. woohoo! Stay tuned, everyone, for a more Marky. Thank All you. right, oh, my goodness, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for sharing this moment with us. For those of you who were not here at the beginning go back and listen to the replay because we have a fun call to action about scrolling through your phone and finding those pictures of you with the amazing women who have walked alongside you, encouraged you and supported you. We have a promotion going on and we would love to have your faces filling the social media feed, showing the world that, psst, don't know if you know this yet, but women support women now. We are done with the cat. <clears throat> with the competition and the comparison, we support each other, we shine a light on each other, and we want you to be part of that program. So make sure to watch for that on March 1st. March 3rd, our beloved Ms. Leslie is doing her very first Coffee and Conversations, 8 a.m. Do not miss that here on the group. And then Sherry Chris will be the cherry on top of the week next week, talking to us about all of the amazing lessons that we can all use in our businesses this year that her organization learned during 2020. So until next week, everyone have a wonderful, a wonderful weekend. Remember to look for those opportunities to develop yourself, to connect with others and to really take your businesses to the next level together. See you later. Bye. Thank you, Marky. Thank you. Bye.